in its last Rezvan message, the Universal House of Justice talked about the maturation of Baha'i institutions. This, of course, was not the first time. Over the years, the Universal House of Justice repeatedly called our attention to the necessity of cultivating our Baha'i institutions, leading them forward until they would assume their proper function in the Baha'i community. Now, all religious communities in history had to govern themselves one way or another. However, no religion until the Baha'i faith had its institutions grounded in the scriptures of the religion itself. For instance, the uh, Christian church uh, came about out of necessity without any biblical authority. There was a vague reference to uh, Peter as the rock on which the church was to be built. But as Shoghi Effendi pointed out, this was only a vague reference, and there was nothing in the Bible that would justify the entire ramified structure that was built up over the centuries later. And the same thing was true in Islam. The imamate was uh, created by Muhammad himself, but there were no specifications as to how it was going to function, what its powers were going to be, and the extent to which the community had to follow it. Now, the Baha'i faith in this respect, the Baha'i administrative order, is unique because Baha'i institutions are actually derived directly from the will of the founder of this religion. It is Baha'u'llah himself who prescribes the formation of Baha'i administrative bodies. For instance, in the Kitab al-Aqdas, the most holy book, Baha'u'llah says, the Lord has ordained that in every city a house of justice be established, wherein shall gather counselors to the number of Baha, which means to the number of nine. It behooveth them to be the trusted ones of the merciful among men and to regard themselves as the guardians appointed of God for all that dwell on earth. So you see, the beginning of the Baha'i administrative order is right there in the Ardas, in the most holy book. And then we have... Uh, some interesting other elements here. For instance, in a tablet uh, we read, addressing the nations, this is from Abdul Baha, addressing the nations, the ancient beauty ordaineth that in every city in the world a house be established in the name of justice, wherein shall gather pure and steadfast souls to the number of the most great name. At this meeting, they should feel as if they were entering the presence of God inasmuch as this binding command hath flown from the pen of him who is the Ancient of Days. The glances of God are directed to the words of this assembly. Now, this indicates to us very clearly that the Baha'i institutions are not something which is produced by the human mind, they are part of the revelation brought to us from God himself. The other thing which has to be kept in mind is that Baha'i institutions are not bureaucracies. These are not simply uh, institutions that regulate the flow of daily events without reference to the spirit and to the morality. In fact, one must remember that in the Baha'i faith, the spiritual and the secular, or the spiritual and the administrative, are always very closely united. This is why even the temporary name of these institutions, the spiritual assembly, it is an assembly which must be permeated with the spirit of the faith and which must resolve daily 
sometimes very ordinary problems, but it must resolve them in the spirit of the faith. It must resolve them spiritually. So we do not want and we do not have the dichotomy between the spiritual and the administrative. These two are united in the spiritual assemblies, whether they be local or national, and obviously in the, in the uh, greater, greatest degree in the Universal House of Justice itself. Uh, and here again is the evidence from the uh, writings of Shoghi Effendi, who says, these spiritual assemblies are aided by the Spirit of God. Their defender is Abdul Baha. Over them he spreadeth his wings. What bounty is there greater than this? These spiritual assemblies are shining lamps and heavenly gardens from which the fragrance of holiness, fragrances of holiness are diffused over all regions and the lights of knowledge are shed abroad over all created things. From them the spirit of life streameth in every direction. They indeed are the potent source of the progress of man at all times and under all conditions. This was written by Abdul Baha and quoted by Shoghi Effendi in God Passes By. So therefore, spiritual assemblies, as I said, are not simply secular institutions. They are spiritual institutions <coughs> which deal with problems of everyday life in this elevated spirit. In every institution or among institutions, obviously there has to exist a certain kind of uh, hierarchy. Not all institutions are on the same level. And in the faith, our supreme institution, the Universal House of Justice, is elevated above all the other institutions. But since there is only one universal house of justice, it cannot take care of all the affairs of every Baha'i community. Today, already, there are more than 30,000 of them. In the future, there will be hundreds of thousands. So there have to be intermediary institutions. And this is why we have national spiritual assemblies. And then there have to be local institutions, they are on the lowest rung of that hierarchical ladder. But this does not mean that they are unimportant. Today we call them local spiritual assemblies. In the future, they will be known as local houses of justice. Now that in itself has a great deal of significance because the local house of justice is going to be the source of the governance for a Baha'i community and also a source of comfort, protection, guidance, and education for every individual Baha'i. Speaking of this, we have a uh, passage that discusses or uh, in which Shoghi Effendi characterizes uh, some of these activities of the assemblies. He writes, designated as spiritual assemblies, an appellation that must in the course of time be replaced by their permanent and more descriptive title, the Houses of Justice, bestowed upon them by the author of the Baha'i Revelation, instituted without any exception in every city, town, and village where nine or more adult believers are resident, annually and directly elected on the first day of the great Baha'i festival by all adult believers, man and woman alike, invested with an authority rendering them unanswerable for their acts and decisions to those who elect them, solemnly pledged to follow under all conditions the dictates of the most great justice that can alone usher in the reign of the most great peace, which Baha'u'llah has proclaimed and must ultimately establish. 
charged with the responsibility of promoting at all times the best interests of the communities within their jurisdiction, of familiarizing them with their plans and activities, and of inviting them to offer any recommendations they might wish to make, supported by local funds to which all believers voluntarily contribute. These assemblies, the representatives and custodians of the faith of Baha'u'llah, have abundantly demonstrated by virtue of their achievements their right to be regarded as the chief sinews of Baha'i society, as well as the ultimate foundation of its administrative structure. Now, this is a tremendous statement. And if one is to analyze it, one sees some elements that have to be stressed. One of these elements is that the local spiritual assemblies, once elected, are not responsible to the electorate. They are responsible only in one sense, in a spiritual and a moral sense. Obviously, if, they're, if they fail in their duties, they will have to answer to God for whatever mistakes they commit. But they are not responsible to the electorate. They are not to be influenced by the notion of re-election or non-re-election. They are pledged to the most great justice. The moment that the members of the local assembly enter their chamber for consultation, they must put aside all considerations except the achievement of what Baha'u'llah refers to as the most great justice. The third element, they must, be prom they, they must promote the best interests of the community. Here again, it is not their own interests that they are supposed to promote. They are supposed to concentrate on the interests of their particular community, which has elected them which loves them, obeys them, and over which they govern. In the process of doing this, they must familiarize, and this is the fourth point, they must familiarize the community with their plans and with their activities. They must not work detached from the rest of the community. At the 19-day feast, on any occasion that comes at hand, the local spiritual assembly must inform the community of what it is doing. The fifth point, which is made in this passage from the writings of Shoghi Effendi, the fifth point is that they must invite recommendations from the local community, which means that they must listen to the voice of the people, listen in a direct sense, not listen in the sense of obey. No, they have no such obligation, but listen with their ear, with their spiritual ear, so that they know the needs and the wants of the local community. And they must invite recommendations from the community. The sixth element here is that they are supported by a fund to which individual Baha'is make their voluntary uh, contributions, so that the local spiritual assembly can function without the fund, which is, as Shoghi Effendi said, the lifeblood of the cause, no institution can, can function. And therefore, these duties and obligations of the local spiritual assembly must, have cert must be fulfilled, but they cannot be fulfilled without the presence of financial means. Now, when I mentioned the hierarchy of Baha'i institutions, starting with the Universal House of Justice, I wanted to say that the local spiritual assembly has a rather special position in that it deals with the individual. 
the Universal House of Justice very rarely will deal with an individual. They create laws and give guidance to the Baha'i world. The National Spiritual Assembly gives guidance to the national community and deals specifically with matters of national interest. The unique role of the local assembly is that it deals with us as people, as individuals. And this is something on which we should dwell for a moment. The local spiritual assembly is assigned certain duties. In the Kitab Agdas, Baha'u'llah writes, it is incumbent upon them, which means on the members of the houses of justice, and here it is general, any house of justice, national house of justice, or as Abdul Baha calls it, secondary house of justice, local house of justice, and the universal house of justice. It is incumbent upon them to take counsel together and to have regard for the interests of the servants of God for his sake, even as they regard their own interests, and to choose that which is neat and seemly. And another passage, this one from Baha'u'llah, from a, a tablet, he says, when in session it behooveth them to converse on behalf of the servants of God on matters dealing with the affairs and the interests of the public. For instance, teaching the cause of God must be accorded precedence inasmuch as it is a matter of paramount importance. Teaching the cause must be viewed according to the conditions of the age and of the times so as to see what course is deemed proper to take. Other matters also should be dealt with in the like manner. Now, Shoghi Effendi specifies what these other matters are. And this is very important because the natural tendency of a human being is to pick some one activity of the assembly and to say that this is the most important activity and therefore it excludes other activities. But a local spiritual assembly is an institution that must deal with the whole life of the community. And Shoghi Effendi makes this abundantly clear when he writes, the matter of teaching, its direction, its ways and means, its extension, its consolidation, essential as they are to the interests of the cause, constitute by no means the only issue which should receive the full attention of these assemblies. So while teaching is a most important element and should take precedence, it is not the only issue to which the assembly must uh, pay attention. A careful study of Baha'u'llah's and Abdul Baha's tablets will reveal that other duties no less vital to the interests of the cause devolve upon the elected representatives of the friends in every locality. It is incumbent upon them to be vigilant and cautious, discreet and watchful, and protect at all time the temple of God from the dart of the mischief maker and the onslaught of the enemy. They must endeavor to promote amity and concord amongst the friends, efface every lingering trace of distrust, coolness, and estrangement from every heart, and secure in its stead an active and wholehearted cooperation for the service of the cause. They must do their utmost to extend at all times the helping hand to the poor, the sick, the disabled, and the orphan, the, win the widow, irrespective of their color, caste, and creed. They must promote by every means in their power the material as well as the spiritual enlightenment of youth, 
the means of education of children institute whenever possible Baha'i educational institutions, organize and supervise their work and provide the best means for their progress and development. They must undertake the arrangement of regular meetings of the friends, the feasts and the anniversaries, as well as the special gatherings designed to serve and promote the social, intellectual, and spiritual interests of their fellow men. Now, this is, of course, a very, very tall order, but you see how all-embracing the duties of the local spiritual assemblies are. Now, most important of all, in some respects, is that the local spiritual assemblies have to deal with problems of individuals. I said most important of all, shifting sort of to myself from the point of view of an individual this is the most important aspect. There is a relationship between a person and the assembly. And we are told that we can go to the assembly with our personal problems. We can expect uh, help and advice from our institutions. Here again, in a letter written by or on behalf of Shoghi Effendi, it says, he, that is Shoghi Effendi, feels that you should turn to your local assembly in the strictest confidence and seek their aid and help and advice. These bodies have the secret obligation to protect and guide the believers in every way within their power when appealed to. Indeed, they were established just for the purpose of keeping order and unity and obedience to the law of God amongst the believers. You should go to them as a child would go to its parent. Now, this is very significant because, you see, instead of being city hall, instead of being a cold, impersonal institution that deals with individuals as if they were numbers, as if they were things, here is an institution which spiritually is our parent. And Shoghi Effendi specifically says, we can go to the assembly as if we went to our parent, to our father, or to our mother. Now this, of course, imposes a tremendous obligation on the members of the assembly. If they are to be our parents, if they are to deal with our problems, they have to achieve in their activity a certain level of detachment of spirituality which is not an easy thing to achieve. first prerequisite of their success is unity. And again, we have in the writings very, very clear indications as to the importance of unity. Baha'u'llah has given the promise that in every assembly where unity and harmony prevail, there his glorious spirit will not only be present, but will animate, sustain, and guide all the friends in all their deliberations. It is to unity that the guardian has been continually calling the friends. For where a united will exists, nothing can effectively oppose and, hum and hamper the forces of constructive development. So without unity, the local spiritual assembly or the national spiritual assembly cannot function properly. And therefore, when a local assembly meets, their first concern should be the establishment of unity, which, by the way, is not the same as uniformity or an agreement on all things. We will come to that in a minute. 
When unity is established, it becomes easy to concern oneself with the common good. And this, again, is an obligation of the local spiritual assembly. The local spiritual the members of these assemblies, on their part, Shoghi Effendi writes, must disregard utterly their own likes and dislikes, their personal interests and inclinations, and concentrate their minds upon those measures that will conduce to the welfare and happiness of the Baha'i community and promote the common weal. Once the members are in the chambers of the local spiritual assembly, they are not acting as individuals in the interest of a particular group. All their concerns have to be about the well-being of the community as a whole and of every individual within that community. If anyone says that this is a very difficult task, I would instantly agree. There is nothing more difficult than achieving detachment from one's own preconceived notions. In the world, usually, when we come into a meeting, we come with an agenda. We want to push our own views and ideas. Here, that's taboo. We are not permitted to do this. We can bring our own ideas, but the intention should be to offer these ideas for general consultation. And it is out of the general consultation with a view to the good of the common weal of every member of the community that the decision should be made. I mentioned the word consultation. And indeed, the process of consultation is extremely, extremely important because all Baha'i decisions are achieved through that particular process. Uh, this is not the time or the place to discuss consultation as such. That is a topic for a longer discussion, perhaps. But just a few uh, indicators of the importance of consultation in uh, Baha'i practice. In a letter written in 1935 on behalf of Shoghi Effendi, we read, but before the majority of the assembly comes to a decision, it is not only the right but the sacred obligation of every member to express freely and openly his views without being afraid of displeasing or alienating any of his fellow members. In view of this important administrative principle of frank and open consultation, the guardian would advise you to give up the method of asking other members to voice your opinion and suggestions. This indirect way of expressing your views to the assembly not only creates an atmosphere of secrecy, which is most alien to the spirit of the cause, but would also lead to many misunderstandings and complications. The assembly members must have the courage of their convictions, but must also express wholehearted and unqualified obedience to the well-considered judgment and directions of the majority of their fellow members. In other words, one comes into the chamber where the spiritual assembly sits, one brings one's ideas and convictions, one expresses them strongly, if you wish, emphatically, and then detaches oneself from these. That is the essence of the process of consultation. One argues one's point, and once that point has been argued, one removes oneself from the point. It is no longer yours. It now belongs to the group. And whatever the group decides, that is then the decision which every member supports. <coughs> the supremacy of the majority. In this passage and in other passages, we are told that it is the majority that prevails. Now, obviously, in any kind of Baha'i enterprise, the ideal is 
the achievement of unanimity. If uh, we want to go for a picnic or have a party, if let's say there are nine of us, and one of us really doesn't want to have this picnic, how sad it's going to be. We go to a picnic and one of us is not enjoying it. Well, how much more so in the, in the local spiritual assembly? You strive for unanimity. But you cannot stymie the activities of the assembly. You cannot postpone decision forever because of the disagreement of one individual. At some point, the majority has to prevail. And again, in a letter from Shoghi Effendi, 1941, we read, there is only one principle on which to consider the work of an assembly. And that is the supremacy of the will of the majority. The majority decision must be courageously adopted and carried out by the assembly, quite regardless of the opinionated adherence to their own views, which any minority may cling to. In other words, some of us may be a bit opinionated, maybe one of us, maybe two of us. But once the majority has ruled, that minority must accept the decision as if the, the decision were their own. A few words about the conduct of the assembly members. You have a sacred institution. It is elected by the friends, by the Baha'is. It is endowed with grave responsibilities and also a great deal of power. It is to be obeyed by all of us. But that also imposes on the members some very, very heavy obligations. They are answerable to God for their conduct. And we read about their conduct in the writings of Baha'u'llah, of Abdul Baha, and finally summarized in passages from the writings of the Guardian. The duties of those whom the friends have freely and conscientiously elected as their representatives are no less vital and binding than the obligation of those who have chosen them. In other words, we who vote for members of the assembly assume obligations, but we impose obligations also on the members of the, of the assemblies. Their functions, their function, the function of the members of the assembly is not to dictate but to consult, and consult not only among themselves, but as much as possible with the friends whom they represent. They must regard themselves in no other light but that of chosen instruments for a more efficient and dignified presentation of the cause of God. They should never be led to suppose that they are the central ornaments of the body of the cause, intrinsically superior to others in capacity or merit, and sole promoters of its teachings and principles. Now, I personally believe that this is very important to emphasize, because if the fact of the election to the local spiritual assembly somehow endows its members with superiority, then we betray the principles of the Baha'i faith. The assembly has a station. The assembly ranks high. The assembly can exact obedience from us, but not the members of the assembly as individuals. They should never be led to suppose that they are the central ornament of the body of the cause, Shoghi Effendi says. They should approach their task with extreme humility and endeavor by their open-mindedness, their high sense of justice and duty, their candor, 
their modesty, their entire devotion to the welfare and interests of the friends, the cause, and humanity, to win not only the confidence and the genuine support and respect of those whom they serve, but also their esteem and real affection. It is therefore the duty of the members of the assembly as individuals to behave in such a way that they will win the esteem and even, one hopes, the love of the members of the, of the community. They should, within the limits of wise discretion, take the friends into their confidence, acquaint them with their plans, share with them their problems and anxieties, and seek their advice and counsel. So you see, the relationship here is a reciprocal relationship. It is not one-sided. It is not all going from the community to the assembly. It must, the affection, the love, must go both ways. The community must love the assembly, and the members of the assembly, every individual member, must reciprocate this love for the community. Now, the local spiritual assembly, unlike the Universal House of Justice, is not an infallible body. In this respect, it is like the National Spiritual Assembly, which also is not an infallible body. Assemblies can make mistakes. However, our attitude toward those mistakes is what matters a great deal. And here again, I would like to turn toward some writings which give us clues as to how to react to this. The believers should have confidence in the directions and orders of their assembly, even though they may not be convinced of their justice or right. Once the assembly, through a majority vote of its members, comes to a decision, the friends should readily obey it. The assembly may make a mistake, but as the master pointed out, if the community does not abide by its decisions, or the individual Baha'i, the result is worse, as it undermines the very institution which must be strengthened in order to uphold the principles and laws of the faith. He tells us God will right the wrongs done. We must have confidence in this and obey our assemblies. He therefore strongly urges you to work directly under your Baha'i assembly, to accept your responsibilities as a voting member, and do your utmost to create harmony within the community. This, of course, is contrary to the habits and the ways of the world today. Throughout this country and throughout much of the world, there has grown up a distrust of all institutions, especially institutions that govern society. The worst motives are attributed to them. There is distrust of them in every respect. Words such as politician now mean virtually a crook. If the government is involved, you know it must be something bad. Now, that is not the spirit of the Baha'i administrative order. Here, we go so far as to say, even if an as the assembly makes a mistake, we will accept this mistake. We will try to right it. We will appeal to a higher institution, but we will not disrupt the life of the community. We will obey and, through our obedience to our institutions, correct those institutions. This is a principle unlike anything else that you find today in the world at large. The subject of... Uh, the local spiritual assembly is enormous. I have only scratched the, surf, the surface. I would like to reiterate at the end that the entire 
Baha'i administrative order is a kind of a miracle of governance. It is in its infancy today. It is not functioning smoothly. But that is the challenge which every Baha'i faces. We must work, we must pray, we must strengthen these institutions because without them, without this institutional skeleton, the faith itself cannot exist. Shoghi Effendi talks about these institutions and about their future. And I would like to finish with a uh, quotation from Shoghi Effendi. He says, Ours dearly loved co-workers is the paramount duty to continue with undimmed vision and unabated zeal to assist in the final erection of the edifice, the foundations of which Baha'u'llah has laid in our hearts, to derive added hope and strength from the general trend of recent events, however dark their immediate effects, and to pray with unremitting fervor that he may hasten the approach of the realization of that wondrous vision which constitutes the brightest emanation of his mind and the fairest fruit of the fairest civilization the world has as yet seen.